Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel, part of Arendao. Happy to be here today and have a few folks very interested in DAO governance and specifically anti-capture. So Spencer Grams has accepted to, to come and share a little bit about the, the framework that he's developing. Um, he's a contributor at DAO House, uh, very much part of the core, as well as other protocols, and he's been doing some amazing thinking in this space. So I'm, I'm very excited for him to, to share this piece that I particularly fell in love with, uh, and I find it to be pretty fundamental to, to the very idea of what a DAO is. So, um, Spencer, over to you. If you'd like to add uh, anything about yourself or context, please feel free to. The, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel, and and thanks everybody for for having me here um, at at R and I'm I'm really excited to to share some of these ideas that I've been thinking about, and kind of see see what you think. Uh, so I guess I'll just I'll just get going. I have I have a, a brief um, sort of intro here. Um, Daniel kind of introduced me quite quite well. I spend most of my time these days at uh, at Dow House. I've been uh, in like, full, working full time in was basically the DAO space for almost a couple years. Um, started off a little bit more at Raid Guild, but have have done more recently at, at DAO House, and a few other other projects as well. Sort of at various various times and in in various places in the space. Um, but the reason I, I bring up DAO House here is that the the background for all of this was like a couple of years ago where DAO House was just kind of getting started. And when I was just getting started at, at DAO House, uh, it was, there were really not many games in town when it came to creating a DAO. Uh, there was DAO House, there was Aragon, DAO Stack, Colony, and I'm probably forgetting a couple others. And um, pretty shortly thereafter, we had things like Compound Governor and the template that, that MakerDAO is using. But outside of that, there was not a ton. And then like nine months ago, maybe maybe a year ago now, if time moves quickly, I don't really uh, remember exactly when, we had this explosion of DAO activity. Like all these new people jumping in, thinking about DAOs, building new DAO tools, starting new DAOs, on and on and on. And it was amazing. And it really forced uh, me in, in the context that I was sort of experiencing from as, as a contributor to DAO House to better understand like, DAO House's place in all of that but also why I, I was having this reaction that some of the new things that were coming up weren't quite DAOs, even though the people were talking about them as DAOs. And that was both something that I felt emotionally, um, but also couldn't, at, the, at that point, articulate intellectually uh, why. So I, I kind of started on this, this sort of personal journey to figure that out. And through like multiple fits and starts and like, dead ends and like going backwards and getting feedback, what I ended up landing on is what we're now calling the anti-capture framework. And originally it was meant to answer, for me, the answer to the question, like what is actually a DAO? Um, what is a DAO actually? But I think it has the promise to help us address a, a number of other questions. Um, so I, I'm talking about it less now as, as like how to define a DAO and more about this concept of capture resistant governance, which we'll get into in, in a second. But where I really hope that anti-capture can, can play a role in this ecosystem is creating a shared language and a foundation on which to build knowledge and practices uh, relating to that concept of capture resistant governance, decentralized communities, Web3, DAOs, power dynamics, all of this stuff that is sort of boiling in, in this space. Um, there's so shared language and kind of this foundation for, for building on top and then supporting disciplined exploration and debate and discussion. I think a lot of times what we see right now in, in this space is like people sort of shouting past each other because they don't have a shared language and they don't have a shared framework for talking about what they're talking about. Hopefully anti-capture can help there. And then finally, what I hope this becomes is a community of practice or a community of research um, sort of spread across lots of different other communities or sort of inside of and, and together with lots of other different communities to better understand what's going on here and to build on top of it and to, to kind of really attack this, this question um, at the ground level. And so some of the values that I've like started to ascribe to, to what I've been doing and, and what I hope this can become is 
focus first and foremost on, on first principles and be as non-prescriptive as possible. And earlier versions of this, I think were a little bit too prescriptive and, and could, were, could, could have been interpreted a, like a little bit too much as telling people how they should build their DAO and like what a DAO, what a DAO is and what a DAO isn't in a way that didn't allow people to be creative with how they constructed what they were doing. So this is anti-capture now is, is attempting to be extremely uh, unopinionated about uh, and then sort of not making value judgments, just creating the, the foundations or the framework with which to think about those things. I myself have opinions based on those, um, but that is not part of the anti-capture framework. It's also meant to be modular and uh, and facilitating permissionless contribution to the concept and, and the frameworks themselves. And we'll get to that kind of at the end and, and where I, I think that can go. Okay, so that's like all sort of throat clearing. Um, before I before I dig in, uh, I just wanna invite everybody as I'm kind of work talking through this stuff, I wanna invite people to interrupt me or raise their hands or ask questions. Um, this is a little bit challenging to describe in a linear fashion. There's lots of like interleaving components as much as I tried have tried to make it modular. Uh, so it's it's not really a linear kind of thing. So if you have questions, even if you think they might be skipping ahead, or even if you think they might be sort of like reaching backwards to something I already talked about, please do chime in. It, it might actually be helpful for everybody to hear your question and have a, a discussion around that. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna actually start with with resources and th this concept before we get into um, before we get into the framework itself. And the reason I think is that what really helped me understand the, the kind of the weight of all of this is that one of the big challenges that we as like society face is that there are increasing benefits to pooling our resources together. Um, we can do more when we kind of pool resources together or have shared resources and solve bigger problems, more important problems, build better stuff than we can, we can ever hope to acting just individually with our own resources. However, there's also lots of challenges and costs that get created. The larger the pool of resources is, the larger the things that we're sharing are. And those are some of the big challenges in, in governance. This kind of gets to the, the coast theorem and like theory of the firm kind of stuff where there's all these transaction costs um, sort of on the one side in a marketplace, but there's also this like coordination costs inside of an organization. The bigger that organization gets, the harder it becomes to, to manage that. And what I have started to realize is that a lot of those coordination costs are associated with introducing protections and sort of this like scaffolding to prevent those shared resources from getting captured by the people that are in the organization. Um, I could talk about that for a, a long time, but I'm going to stop because there's, there's more to get to. But I, I wanted to start here because that's really the lens with which I have started to best understand why this stuff is a problem or like there's a problem here in, in the first place. Uh, so I, I mentioned the word capture and it's in the, it's in the title of the thing. Um, it probably means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but the way that I'm defining it within this context is a, so a, a diversion of shared resources. So resources that have been pooled together that people are sharing to do something that they are governing to take actions to like solve some problem together, a diversion of the, those resources for private benefit. And there's a gazillion examples of this. Our society is riddled with capture. Our governments are have been captured by like big corporations for for years and years, and also by by politicians who take bribes and who push things in their own direction and who uh, who make stock trades based on insider information. Um, like it's it's <laughs> it's bad, uh, but that is capture um, sh diversion of shared resources per, for private benefit.
we now, as of like three years ago, for the first time I think ever, have actual tools to have actual capture, like create actual capture resistant governance. So instead of creating, like trying to simulate this stuff with, with this like legal system and layers upon layers of uh, power structures and hierarchy, we now actually, I think, have the tools to prevent capture of resources uh, at a fundamental, in a fundamental way. And I'll get into all of that like as part of, part of the framework, but this is what I'm focused on. We have these new tools. Let's think about them as best we can and try to use them to create better ways of working together and pooling our resources so we can actually do big, important stuff and solve big, important problems. Okay, um, <laughs> this is the anti-capture framework, this is it. Uh, there's four pieces of it and they all look very basic. And in a sense, they all are very basic, but we're gonna step through each of them you know, one at a time uh, because there's, there's a, a fair amount of nuance and, and detail within them. And we're definitely not gonna get to it at all, all, all of it today. And I definitely have not been able to uh, kind of understand all of it and then go that's kind of why I wanted to come here and talk about it and then like hopefully inspire everybody to to help uh, with it but there's really four components networks agents we can also think of those as persons resources as I hinted at before and actions and each action has uh, four phases so we'll, we'll get into it uh, we'll get into it now okay so so networks why why are we talking about networks Really what we're using networks to do is model groups of people or groups of agents. Anytime you have uh, multiple people that are related in some way, we can model that as a network. There's probably several different types of networks that we can describe with, with this framework that we have. For, the purpose, for our purposes today, easiest to think about a network as just one way to model an organization. So an organization is a network and the members of that organization or the members of the, the, the individuals inside of that network, we can model them as agents. And one of the reasons that we're using this language here is it kind of gives us access to a long like history and literature of network analysis. And we can hopefully at some point start to do more formal an analysis of, of this stuff using the, 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 the mechanisms or the, the concept of networks and, and agent-based modeling. So that, that's a network um, and then agents. I have also been you know, recommended to start calling them persons because agents tend to mean something from a legal perspective. Uh, so it kind of, I, I, you might hear me talk about agents and, and persons at, at different points, but really they, they mean the same thing. Any questions at, at this point? It's still simple. We're, we're getting into the thornier stuff in, in, in a sec. Okay. Um, all right. So we've we've already seen seen these three boxes here. Uh, I'll get a little bit a little bit into to more detail here. Um, so many things within a network can be modeled as as shared resources. Um, and so so what are shared resources? Shared resources are anything that multiple people, multiple agents, in other words, a network can actually control uh, collectively. Um, so there are certain types of resources that might be able to inf like be influenced in, in some way by, by uh, outside people, by other people, but really are only fundamentally at the end of the day controlled by an individual. So those are only private resources. So, so an individual person's attention, an individual person's time. At the end of the day, barring like physical coercion, which we're not even going to talk about here, uh, those are yours to decide what to do with. You might be influenced to, to change your mind about how you're uh, spending your time or paying attention, uh, but ultimately they are yours. On the other hand, there are things that are resources that are shared or can be shared. And, and by shared, I mean able to be governed and controlled like fundamentally by a collective or by a group or by an organization 
or more generally. Available. So public Ethereum state is, is a primary example here. Um, but so are coordination mechanisms. So including a smart contract or uh, governance policies or, or certain things that actually control the way other things are controlled. Yeah, uh, Spencer, we have uh, Sandy who has a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, I was just wondering where you would put um, the owner of the Discord, <laughs> the Discord or the Twitter accounts or any of these other um, resources that we're using to communicate and organize on, but tend to be belonging yeah. to one person. Yeah, totally. So um, I would call, so like a Discord server is kind of a coordination mechanism. You can call it like a communication mechanism in a sense. That is absolutely something that a network um, can either share control of or more re realistically today, they are delegating somebody or trusting somebody to control it on their behalf. So in a sense, the, the I forget the name, but like the, the person who starts a Discord server, the admin of the Discord server, the owner of it, right now there's, there's not a great way to actually put that in control of, of the network as a whole. Um, so as we'll see, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty big risk factor. That is a, a capture vector that, that exists. So I, a common theme for, for me now that I kind of have this language is sort of identifying things that are capture vectors and one thing I really hope that we can do in the DAO space is over time, it's not gonna be fast, but over time start to like bring more things into the world of, of like Web3 and smart contracts and, and, um, and, and blockchains and like the true Web3 tech stack so that we can actually control them collectively rather than relying on an individual to do so. So that, that's a great example of of a coordination mechanism that should be shared in within networks right now, but is not as shared as not not controlled in a shared way as as much as it should be. Okay. Um, resources a little bit tricky. I'll try to talk a, a, a little bit more about different examples of resources in as, as we as we move on. Um, okay. So the the final section here is the biggest section. Uh, but it's it's about actions. So the, the the concept here is that everything this might f sound circular or sort of tautological, but everything that everybody does is an action. Um, and actions in this framework have four phases. So it starts with well, you you could you could kind of put the starting point at any point, but I have decided that just for the for simplicity here, we're going to talk about things as starting with a propose phase, moving to the decide phase, to execute, and then to evaluate. So actions are are cyclical because typically actions lead to evaluation, which leads to new information, which leads to a new action to take or multiple options for actions to take. And importantly, I don't know if you can see it in in the screen here, but <laughs> I've tried to put some little squares or rectangles inside of each, the, each of these rectangles to visualize the idea that actions are also recursive. So inside of each phase are other actions that are sort of embedded in, in, in each phase. So I, as an individual, I am like my brain cells are sort of going through this loop inside of my brain, like each of my, like different parts of my brain are doing this. And then that's leading to my individual actions, which then might be inside of some broader networks actions uh, that we're that we're taking. It's a little bit tricky. The recursion is a little bit challenging at first, but I think it really unlocks uh, a, a sort of a simpler way of, of thinking about all of this stuff and sort of parsimonious way of, of modeling these things. So bear with me a little bit on, on that. All right, so I'm gonna step through each of these because these are each of these are, are pretty important, especially decide and, and execute. And, and this is where we're gonna where we're gonna actually get some DAO, <laughs> DAO kind of language. And you can see that on the left here with centralized and, and decentralized. So what happens in the proposed phase? So in the proposed phase, basically we ask the question, 
what are the options on the table? Or somebody brings an option to the table. And it might be one option, two options, three options, four options. But they're basically saying, I propose that we do one of these things. Or I propose that we do X or Y. And maybe somebody else proposes Z. Um, what I, what I want to make sure that we're, we're focusing on each of these phases is where the phase kind of has, where there's a vector to capture shared resources inside of that phase of action. So remember, we're, we're trying to prevent capture of the resources that we are sharing. And so each phase might introduce some vulnerabilities or some vectors that where shared resources can be captured. And one example here is that, and, and again, this is one of the challenges of this being a linear talk, uh, we'll see that execution is really important. So I'm going to pause on this on this second bullet, and we'll come back to it. Um, but what I want you guys to all notice is as an example of a shared resource here within the propose phase. So there is a, this network or a network might have a, a particular capacity to process new actions. Um, there's, you know, attention, um, that kind of capacity is definitely a, a scarce resource. So that network sort of has collectively this, this resource about that, that is described by their capacity to process new actions. Every new proposal that we, that we introduce draws down, like is basically drawing against that capacity. So there's a, a trade-off that we have to make here. If we allow anybody to introduce a new proposal and we allow the propose phase to be hyper decentralized, then we're actually drawing down against this shared resource. And so we need to think a little bit about how that works. And what a lot of DAO frameworks have done is they said, okay, anybody can make a proposal, but then to get to the next phase, somebody within the network, within the DAO needs to sort of sponsor it or um, approve it to get to the next phase. And there's many ways of doing that. Um, but often we have this like, what looks like a little bit of a funky thing where we have hyper decentralized ability to bring something to the table but then a little bit of a, of a membrane or a barrier towards moving it to the next phase. But I think it's really important that um, from, a, from an anti-capture or a capture resistance perspective, that uh, the proposed phase be, um, that be decentralized, be something that anybody, especially anybody within the network can bring something new to the table. And that's especially the case in you know, more formal DAO frameworks, where the only things that you can actually take actions on as, as a network, as a DAO, are things that have been proposed formally. So you can imagine if, if there is a, if everybody can make, like everybody in the world can make a decision about something, but only one person in the world can, can decide or can like propose what that decision should be about, then that one person has all of the power and all of the control. And they have then basically captured what, what's happening. So it's important to, to support or kind of foster decentralization within the proposed phase. OK. Uh, next is decide. Um, what, I, what I've realized is that the decide phase doesn't actually have any shared resources at stake. So even if the decide phase, decide phase is highly decentralized or hi highly centralized, that, and somebody has say like a ton of influence over what gets decided, that by itself does not mean that there has been capture. Um, so you could have and, and we'll see the, the reverse of this in, in a second as well. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of flexibility within the decide phase about how DAOs or communities can go about making decisions if, as we'll see, they have a, a, a decentralized or distributed uh, execute phase. I know that sounds a little bit confusing right now, but I think... Um, you know, I'm just going to go right ahead to the execute phase because that's where the this is where the meat is. So, um, 
Uh, Sandy, go ahead. Um, so, a couple questions. Sure. The, well, for one, I've been learning a lot about uh, citizen assemblies and the, what seems to be missing in, in a lot of these kinds of governance models is the deliberation phase. So you say uh, decide to execution, but decide to me seems like a vote. So there's this whole period of time before a vote, which is like the deliberation piece of it, which is crucial, right? It's how you're engaging your community, how you're having these discussions. Um, there, there are tools out there for, for that. I just think it's something that's really missing in a lot of these conversations. But the one tool that I found really promising is this idea of citizen assemblies, um, because I feel like a lot of DAOs are now leaning towards like delegated uh, powers and like, I'm gonna delegate, I can't be there for every conversation, so I'm gonna delegate, I trust this person, which is a whole other interesting thing about how do you trust people in a DAO. <laughs> but, um, you know, and reputation points and all of these things to me seem to be kind of like, uh, well, we're just rewarding people that are kind of developing the most content or the, the loudest people or, you know, um, and that seems like a whole capturing process going on right before our eyes. And the citizen assembly is really about randomizing almost like a jury and selecting from your community, a smaller group of people that are more random, um, uh, they're fairly sorted to represent your community. And so then they get kind of tasked with this uh, deliberation process uh, and then making recommendations to be voted on. And I think that that is something very interesting that could be added to this kind of process that would be maybe even more fair than what we're seeing developing right now. Yeah, I, so totally. The, the decide phase, as I have kind of, um, as I conceptualize it, includes deliberation. It includes all of the processes of an, any, like of a set of people inside of a network or even brain cells uh, doing all the things that lead to them making a decision. So that, that so after, once the options are on the table, the decide phase starts and that includes deliberation, discussion, debate, uh, um, persuasion, in like all like all the all of that, and all the possibilities for how that can work are sort of encapsulated within the decide phase. Okay, we have a few other questions here. I think uh, Andrea. Andrea or uh, Andrea. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll add. I want to plus one what Sandy said. Um, I think one way to capture that is you've talked about the shared resource in the proposal phase being the attention. And I think that that is here in spades. So I think noting the fact that attention is a, a shared resource in this phase is also critical. Attention yeah, and maybe I, even knowledge. If you, I don't have a good sense of what your taxonomy of resources is, but I can think of a number of, of resources, shared resources that play in here. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there's, I was kind of mentioning before, there's a lot of nuance that I have not really approached yet. <laughs> and I think that's that's a excellent example of stuff like, I've sort of, it's like kind of there, but definitely not as much and like as built out as it, as it needs to be. I think there's like a lot of stuff that can, that needs to be teased out uh, more. Um, and that that's a great example. Thank you. I think we have, is that Opera? Yeah. So yeah, it was also just, I thought it was first, thank you so much for the, the presentation. It's really, it's really quite insightful. Um, and I also just was thinking about what Sandy was saying, because I also feel that in the, in the decide phase, especially because you mentioned that something that happens is, is persuasion and, and in accordance with, so I guess in order to, to reduce capture, like the, this actually is a phase that it could have very high capture risk depending on how those those decisions are made. For example, if you just have one thought leader that that can easily persuade others, and I guess that's just a human problem that we we have to solve, isn't it? 
Um, yeah. <laughs> the claim that I'm sort of implicitly making here is that um, there's the like, two types of power. Like one type of power is sort of influence or like social power in a sense. Like um, I can kind of convince you of something and you'll sort of follow me in that. Uh, another power, another sort of power is like fundamental power. Like I can make something happen literally. Um, and I don't, and the, the sort of the marker of the, if I don't have fundamental power is that I actually have to convince you to to do it with me. Oh, okay. So this, the decide phase is sort of the domain of influence. So absolutely there is a risk of capture by people with a high degree of influence in, in some fashion. Um, but that alone is not enough to sort of consolidate the capture. And, and that happens um, primarily within the execute phase. So the execute phase is actually backing up a little bit in organizations, in like the way we think about everything. And I, I've started to, to notice this more and more as I've had this new language in my head. Everybody talks about organizations making decisions. Everybody talks about executives making decisions. What they don't talk about is the actual action associated with that decision. They sort of lump the action into the, 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 the decision itself. And I think that's a mistake. Um, but it's, it's understandable because in traditional organizations, the power to decide and the power to execute on the thing that actually changes or impacts the, the shared resource are, are bundled together, typically. Like you have a, an executive or a CEO or something or the president or you know the somebody at the top or somebody sort of in the hierarchy, at the top of the hierarchy. They have both powers. Um, and that's, that's because of the way like we've traditionally had to organize our, ourselves and, and structure the way that that our, our organizations work. I think what is really, really unique about smart contracts and what they enable for DAOs is that we can separate the two. So no longer is the person or the people, or sometimes they're the same, but we can, we, we've separated them. So no longer is it required that the, the power to make the final decision and the power to execute that the action decided by that decision, no longer are those the same thing. And we can see this in, um, well, actually to, to explain that a little bit further, I'll, I'll talk about execute a little bit more. So execute is the phase in which something, an option or an action that has been selected is actually put into action. So in, in, in a DAO, like on chain, this is the money, the transaction is actually sent to send the funds somewhere else. The transaction is actually sent to um, uh, give somebody new shares in the DAO. The action is actually sent to upgrade that contract that the DAO controls. That, or the trans, like the literal transaction changing the state of the blockchain. That is separate from all of the decisions associate, like all of the everything associated with how we got to the point where we made that decision, um, even before we took the action. So you can think of like the, the clearest way to understand this is looking at um, constructions like uh, snapshot and a multisig. So those are those are separate, right? Like the decision is made by some amorphous group of token holders voting in this off-chain. Uh, snapshot vote. The action is executed by the handful of multi-sig signers that like turn the keys to make the transaction go to change the state of the blockchain. So that is like execute and decide like very, very separate. The problem with that, of course, is that we have very, very concentrated execution powers even though we have very, very widespread decision-making powers or decision-making influence. So that is an, a, a phenomenal, like that is the primary example of, um, of a capture vector within the execute phase. Even though the decide phase was extremely decentralized, if the execute phase is concentrated or centralized, then we have real problems.
then what we're doing, we're basically reducing our organization to trusting several people. Now that's better than trusting, having to trust a single CEO, cert certainly, but it, it falls short in my view, and this is me inserting my opinions now, it falls short in my view from what we can accomplish with the tools that we now have. And what we can accomplish is we can decentralize or distribute the executive power. Um, so the uh, examples of this are DAOs that have on-chain uh, on chain voting, basically. So voting in those cases is like a formal way of deciding, but also the way in which actions are execu executed. The execute phase is also primarily where the autonomy portion of a or kind of property of a DAO comes from. DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, the autonomy really comes from the execute phase being something that cannot be changed by somebody that is outside of the network. So, own, so if um, if somebody outside the network has the power to change or to actually execute actions that that involve the network's shared resources, then that or that network is not actually autonomous. This is, of course, a spectrum, um, but this is where I believe that the autonomy part of DAOs or sort of similar types of organizations primarily comes from. All right, there's a lot more to say about, about ex execute, and I definitely have not discovered all of it myself either. Um, does anybody have questions or thoughts here? Brad and Andrea. So in the case, for for example, so in the case where, where for example, I'll use an example in in Cosmos where we have, we have proposals that go on chain and then embedded in the proposal is a software upgrade, and then the so after the proposal, if the majority of stakeholders um, vote for the proposal to pass, then then obviously the decision and the execute phase phase become are are totally interlinked. Um, so I guess in this case, the the tendency toward capture just comes from from the way that the vote is is conducted, and, and I guess it yes. So so in this case, in this case, where does the where do the largest risks um, in your assessment? To, where where are the largest risks toward to to becoming vulnerable to capture when it's when things happen like you you mentioned that execute and and decide are kind of bundled. Um, yeah, so I, I think when execute and decide are, or when, ex, I guess what I will, what I will say is that execute and like sort of the final, final stage of the decide phase are bundled. Certainly there's, there's discussion and, and debate and kind of maybe even like rough consensus that has been reached prior to that, that vote going or that proposal actually being voted about. Uh, on chain is that is that fair to say yes yeah so i think um you know, that that's that's pretty typical um and i think I mean, certainly there are going to be vectors for for capture there primarily in um in sort of influence like i guess in an example would be like vitalik may have some ability to capture the Ethereum ecosystem by like really trying hard to push uh, protocol decisions in a, in a certain direction, um, given his fairly high degree of, of influence within, within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, that said, he, doesn't ha he does not have the sole, not, and it's not on-chain voting for, for protocol upgrades, but he does, even if it, even without that, he certainly doesn't have the sole execution powers, and that that is typically left to the the people who are running, uh, like miners are running nodes, and I suspect the same is actually not as familiar with with Cosmos protocol upgrades. But one of the things that makes blockchains really powerful is that uh, the shared resources, the primary shared resource, is the public state that they create, that people can build off of. Um, and the decision 
or the, the, the actions that individual miners or validators or node runners are taking is actually deciding which version of the public state they are following. Uh, so they are actually sort of a slightly different form of execution um, in, in, a, in a kind of a traditional blockchain sort of way. It's, it's like aggregated execution where everybody's individual actions you know, aggregate together to create this or to basically select and act on this, this shared state. Um, so it, like, there are definitely vectors, but it's like one of the vectors for capture. But I would say it's like one of the one of the better and most capture resistant forms. I would say, Andrea. Um, I maybe this is an ask for things to add to the deck, and there's some chance that the, that sure. what I'm asking for is already in the future. Um, there's two things that I would like to have to sort of test out and think through this model. One okay. is like a lot of examples of what you mean by capture. And my instinct is that there's sort of this continuum of capture. There's the things that everybody would say, oh yeah, that's totally, you know, that was a rug pull that, you know, somebody went in and, and, and like pulled stuff, you know, did stuff. And then there's the stuff of, well, that wasn't really capture. That was Vitalik influencing everybody and convincing people of something that you know, it's sort of for his benefit, or maybe it's not for his benefit. So that's squishiness. And I think that that would be useful. I think, and then I think I'm interested in, I bet that there are styles of capture. You talk about vectors. Um, and maybe what I'm looking for is like, what are examples of different kinds of vectors in, in the, the capture uses to get in? So yeah. I will leave that there. Um, either it's there that's or good. That's we helpful. can build it on, on it later. Yeah. Yeah. Th I think th there's like many different lenses or angles with which to view this this stuff or understand it. Um, I have kind of landed on the ones that have worked for me, but that doesn't mean that there aren't many others that will help other people as well. Um, so those are two great great ideas. Um, I will w hold hold that thought actually. Okay. Um, all right, we have about 11 minutes left, so I'm going to make sure that we kind of wrap up the the meat of this. Execute really is the meat, so we're almost there. Um, I just want to end with, well, not end with, but the, the final like like section of, of, of this is the evaluate phase. I have not explored this very deeply yet. I'm sure there's a lot more to it here, um, but really the as you might imagine, evaluate is analyzing the impact of the thing that the action that we just took of the action that was just executed or, you know, months ago or, or whatever. Um, there is a lot of sort of influence to be gained, I think, in participating in evaluation. I don't think there's like really concrete sort of fundamental um, power at, at stake here or fundamental share like act really shared resources with the network at stake within Evaluate. Um, so I, that's why I haven't paid a ton of attention to it yet. But there is a ton of importance here with respect to transparency and access to information. By blocking off that access to information, you can absolutely uh, prevent somebody from even thinking about something that would be appropriate for the network or, or uh, change something that would prevent you from capturing the network. So there's, there's definitely risks and capture vectors here within the evaluate phase. Um, but I, I think at this point, they primarily relate to um, information transparency, information access, that kind of thing. OK. Um, uh, oh, yeah. So this is a sort of a, like first case study, I guess, of using this framework. I'm actually going to speed through this a little bit. Um, and But I, I will say that I think what I've come to recognize is that DAOs in the way that at least I think about them are the strongest form of capture resistant governance that we have thus far. Um, they're certainly not perfect. And the, the, thing, the, the, the examples of DAOs that we have today are certainly not, not perfect. But I think we can continue to push along this uh, like push towards a state where DAOs are, are really quite capture resistant. Um, here's how I have been thinking about DAOs as 
like using the the capture the anti capture framework and language. So a DAO, in my view, is a network of agents or or persons um, that are governing a shared resource or maybe multiple shared resources. And that governance is basically their common purpose. I'm leaving open common purpose here to be defined or interpreted extremely widely, but I think it's that it, it's the sharing of, of resources and governing or governance over their shared resources that make what might otherwise be a diffuse network an organization. Uh, but the really important thing about a DAO is that the power to execute actions that impact or leverage or manage or use those shared resources is distributed among all of the persons, all of the agents in the network, which is where the decentralization part comes from, and nobody else. So no external agents have any power to execute actions that manage the DAOs or that network shared resource, resources. And that's where the autonomy part comes from. So if you have a group, uh, a, a set of people where only a subset shares in the, the power to execute actions, then that group itself under my definition is not a DAO. The smaller group may be, but the, the larger network is not. That does not mean though that that larger network is not a valid organization that has lots of positive properties. But under my definition, as I've kind of derived from the anti-capture framework, it does not qualify as, as a DAO because it leaves open fairly significant capture vectors within the, um, based on the concentration of executive power. Go ahead, Sandy. I find that people are defining their DAOs by all kinds of uh, various stages of turning into this DAO that they want to become, right? You have like a, an initial idea or a core team. Um, I mean, that technically, I guess, in the tiny little team is, is the DAO. They start bringing people onto the Discord. I mean, it's like, we will eventually get decentralized. There's all kinds of different variations. Um, I think with DAO as an end goal, but they are calling themselves DAO in, in, the, in the process, right? So I think that's something that's interesting. And I also think this, the, um, there's, there are these gated uh, like levels of participation in DAOs now, so there can be like a thousand people in a Discord, but only 25 people have the access to some of the channels or the voting or, or whatever's going on, or you have to prove your expertise to get into a certain group. Um, I, I think all of that's very interesting. I'm curious to hear your take on all that. Yeah, it's definitely a lot fuzzier than <laughs> these fairly, hopefully clean words are sort of pretending it is. Um, and I also think it's totally reasonable for some, for a, a community to call itself a DAO aspirationally, as long as they are like demonstrating progression along that path. Where I personally get a little annoyed is when something, some group of people or like some founders are calling the thing they made a DAO when it's just like a Discord server and they hold, they they maintain all of the power for themselves. Um, that said, there's like tons of stuff. Like it's a, it's a it's a spectrum. There's tons of stuff in between that is absolute. Like its existence is going to challenge this like fairly concrete definition, and that's great. Um, I, I I don't think this is the end point. This is kind of where I am currently currently sitting in, in how I've been thinking about, about DAOs. And I guess I, I also want to underscore that um, there are, let's see, yeah, there are other forms of capture resistant governance. And that's kind of what this, this uh, visual is, is like hopefully articulating or communicating is that there are other forms of capture resistant governance that are really great and like better than what we've had in the traditional world. And so I don't want to denigrate those. What I'm trying to, what I think is helpful though, is to 
create like a little bit more of a disciplined taxonomy of what these things are so that one, we can you know, talk about them in a way that we're not talking past each other. And two, I suspect there are like different tool sets and different practices that apply to each of these different things. And so I, I, what I'm hoping happens is that we can, that this kind of shared understanding, well, what hopefully becomes a shared understanding can help uh, people focus on what they're building and, and um, build things for, for the right like market segments. I'm not sure I fully answered all of your or addressed all of your interesting points, but uh, I tried. <laughs> yeah. We have a, a question from Paulo in the, in the chat. Said, you said that in the evaluate phase, there is a big opportunity for influence to be gained. When persons participate in the evaluate phase, would you say that there should also be a risk of losing influence? And maybe that's why most orgs don't engage in the evaluate phase. Oh, that's interesting. So, you, so are are you saying, Paolo, that there's this concept of so, like, if you misevaluate something, then that would be a reputation loss kind of kind of thing, and and maybe that is why. Um, Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, if you look at traditional organizations, usually they uh, make decisions, and then if a decision produces a bad um, people maybe try to, uh, you know, excuse themselves from responsibility and not participate in the evaluate phase because they don't want to get blamed for the bad decision. Uh, um, and I guess, and I guess that, uh, um, we should have more participation in evaluating the decisions that were made in the house, but maybe we're not having that because nobody wants to take responsibility if something went wrong, right? And um, uh, the, way you, the, the way you phrased it was, for me, a bit one-sided in the sense that it was, if we participate, there's a lot to be gained, but I think that also people try not to participate because they fear that they can lose their reputation if they do. Almost, um, almost certainly, that's, that's true, yeah, I agree. Um, we have, yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. That so I was going to to say the same. Yeah. Okay. No, just uh, we have the question of uh, from Andrea. Does that mean that a DAO with sub DAOs are in DAOs, or is that only if the sub DAOs can control resources that are outside of their own sub area? Yeah, uh, sub DAOs kind of challenge the the autonomy part um, because the the DAO sort of is like the like a, a sub DAO isn't really a sub DAO. Maybe if the parent DAO doesn't have some sort of uh, some sort of control over over what the sub DAO is doing. So I'm not really sure exactly where that fits. I would need to think about that more. But I, I yeah, yeah, there, there's some good stuff there. Yeah. Andrew? Um, I was wondering if, and sorry if this has been discussed before, but I was wondering if any thought has been put into uh, splitting the decision-making phase into sort of two parts. Um, one where you decide the goals and one where you decide and what actions are are conducive to, to those goals. So uh, this is what we did when I worked in a, in a housing co-op. So we were part of a network and we, we decided on our ends. And then separately from that, we decided on means for achieving those ends. If that makes any sense. Yeah, cool. I, I, I really like that. Um, I think there's... I'm going to make a... I'll, I'll sort of make a general comment and then I'll get to the, that specifically. Um, one thing I, I probably could have been clearer about is that the way these phases are sort of constructed is um, is meant to be like a, a sort of observational about how actions are taken rather than um, a prescription or, or like a recommendation for how organizations should actually practically go about it. I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of excellent practical sort of advice or approaches that um, is a lot more detailed and like effective than just thinking about actions as far in, in within these like four big phases that I've described. So I think your your suggestion 
is, is a really interesting one from a practical perspective for, for DAOs. And I think there's a lot of work that I would like to either do myself or, or see done that kind of maps different practices um, back to the, 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 the anti-capture framework and helps both inform like what different um, capture vectors might be, but also uh, might help understand why those different practices are, are good or bad or better or worse or more interesting or more effective uh, than potentially others. I see. And I was, I was also wondering if, if I could briefly try and summarize some of the things that you said so I make sure I understand it correctly. Um, I'm thinking, so when you have a DAO, you have a bunch of people who come together to, and they decide to pool some resources, like uh, money or attention or things like that. And, but they need to decide, they need a coordination mechanism to just figure out how to use those resources because they all have to ag agree on how to use them, of course. So, and I, I was wondering if, if um, oh, I forgot my question. I was going to say something like if uh, the, the attention-making phase where you have to decide like where to, where to put, um, sorry, the decision-making phase, where you have to decide like uh, when people submit proposals and you have to, oh, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Um, okay, I don't know if I can I continue my question there. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, I, I don't want to take up everyone's time. I, I, <laughs> I, someone posted in the chat that we're out of time. Yeah, unfortunately, we, we're, we're three minutes past the time, so I'm, I'm going to have oh, okay. to round it up. Uh, but if Perfect. you'd like to give a uh, thank you, thank you everyone uh, very much for coming. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation, I, I left the link there. Uh, we can continue chatting about it. Uh, Spencer, if you wouldn't mind maybe uh, sharing your, your slides. Uh, yes, absolutely. In, the, in there, and uh, uh, either directly in the, in the channel or you can send it to me and I'll share it with everyone there. Thank you. Thank you everyone very much for attending. Um, great to have you. Amazing talk. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, and thanks everybody. I will share with you, Daniel, because uh, I got to do a couple things. Um, but in that will be a link to, I spun up a new Discord server to talk about this stuff more. I would love for people to, to join in there. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody. This was great. Thank you. Thank great you. job. Thank you. Bye.